The Cemetery by D. E. Atkins. Cindy Moray turned from her mirror, shaking her ice pale hair over her shoulders. Her black dress was cut tight with a long front slit held together by a single glittering button that winked when she moved. Well, if you don't use it, you'll lose it. All right, Lara? <laughs> she drew back her blood red lips to reveal two long pointed vampire fangs. Lara Stepford, lying back on Cindy's snow white bedspread, contemplating her pink nail polish, didn't notice. Lara never noticed anything unless it was male and breathing on her. Lara? What? Oh, get with the program, Lara. I said if you don't use it, you'll lose it, right? What? Oh, the fangs. Mm -hmm. Disgusting. Can you kiss with them on? <laughs> don't you ever think of anything else. Here, would you make yourself useful? Dust oh. my hair with this glitter. You know, Lara, you don't need that wig to look like a princess. Whose wig is it, anyway? Hi, Rapunzel. Rapunzel had long hair. <laughs> Only I can't let anyone climb up it, because if anything happens to it, my mom will kill me. <laughs> oh, dear. Wills will be so disappointed. Oh. <laughs> Your mother wears that wig? Only sometimes. No, don't tell me. Anyway, we better finish. We don't want to keep them waiting. <laughs> <laughs> Cindy went back to her dressing table to put the final touches on her vampire look. Dade Walken and William Lawrence Howell would be arriving any minute. Her father would keep the guys trapped in the library, pouring out drinks and weird fatherly charm. And Wills, who was Lara's current entertainment for, oh, the next ten minutes, would drink his, making that polite, endless conversation that boys with names like William Lawrence Howell were so good at making. Dade, on the other hand, would say, no, thank you, he was driving. But the truth was, he just liked saying no. He liked being in control. Cindy smiled. What would it take to make him lose control? Cindy liked to push people, see what she could make them do, like tonight. She had big plans for tonight. The Halloween dance was only a beginning. Rising, she stood in front of the full mirror and Lara came to join her. The vampire vixen and the fairy princess stood together, smiling. Come on, Lara, it's Halloween. Let's party. <laughs> yeah, let's go. <laughs> On the other side of town, Georgina Butler was getting ready for the same dance and the same party. Not that she'd been invited to the party exactly, but she was going to be there. What was Cindy going to do about it? Throw her out? She hated Cindy. Cindy had a fast mouth and a lot of money, and she liked to push people around. But you can't push me, trendy Cindy. Georgina pulled on her black stockings and slipped on the high black heels. Webs of black moved around her, and silver streaks were painted in her spiked black hair. On the front of her short black turtleneck dress was a red design, an hourglass that she'd carefully painted on herself. When the final touches were complete, she surveyed herself in her mirror. Georgie. The Black Widow Spider Woman. She smiled. I'm gonna have a good time tonight. The doorbell rang, and she went down to greet her date. Her very special date. Cindy was going to have a fit when she saw them together at her exclusive little party. Yes, Georgie was going to have a very good time. Foy Villanova was headed up the long driveway of the big old Wales house, behind the thick, towering hedges that were so important in this part of town. Very rich people kept very large houses behind those hedges. And with that kind of money, anything was possible. Like him and Jane Wales. Except between them, the possibilities had kind of worn out. Foy and Jane had known each other all their lives. They'd done a little obligatory fumbling, but basically they'd come up just friends. Foy frowned. The trouble was, Jane might not want to be just friends. He was tired of the whole bit. But what would happen when he told Jane?
Good evening, Mr. Foy. Good evening, Hodges. The Wales family's elderly butler betrayed no surprise at the sight of the blonde boy dressed in a long robe painted with magic symbols, carrying a necromancer's hat under one arm. Come in, Mr. Foy. If Mrs. Wales is in the living room. I'll tell Miss Jane you're here. Thank you, Hodges. From the top of the stairs, Jane Wales watched Foy go by in the hallway below. Then she looked at herself in the tall hallway mirror. Dorothy, in the Wizard of Oz, her brown hair and pigtails. Was it too juvenile? Cindy said anybody with money could look good. But then Cindy just liked the way money looked. Charity Webster said Cindy's best color was the color of money. She'd said it to Cindy. Jane had been paralyzed. Cindy had a knack for bringing out the worst in people somehow, and it made her powerful. Jane mused on this as she stared at herself in the mirror. I'd like some power for a change. I'm tired of being in Kansas. What I need is your basic tornado. Some action, baby. Miss Jane, Mr. Foy is here. I left him with your mother. Thank you, Hodges. I'm coming now. Oh, I will have a good time. I will, I will, I will. Rick Carmack was pleased with his costume. It was classic Rick. A psycho Santa Claus in a blood-spattered suit with a plastic axe to go with it. It had the maximum shock effect. Even his old man had flinched a little when he first saw it. Oh. <laughs> What's the matter, Father? Never seen any blood before? <laughs> Rick's father always kept an automatic smile on his face, like a permanent grimace. It probably came with being a mortician. Rick's father was sort of the McDonald's of the funeral business. The whole thing made Rick nervous. Everyone thought he was a big jokester, a party animal. The truth was that Rick was afraid of being still for even one minute. Because being still meant being dead. And Rick had had his fill of death. Moving at his usual top speed, Rick bounded toward the front door. Happy Halloween, Dad! I'll give my regards to the dead! Will's howl was annoyed. Annoyed that he'd agree to double with Dade and Cindy. Annoyed that he'd agree to come with Dave and Dave's big old Chevy. Annoyed at being upstaged. As if he'd read Wills' mind, Dave glanced over from behind the steering wheel and surveyed Wills' costume. Very original, Wills. Hey, at least people will know I'm Freddy Krueger. Yeah, that's so right for you, Wills. Let me introduce myself. As Lord Highness Death. Mr. Death, do you? Freddy Krueger and Mr. Death. We're kind of working the same side of the street, wouldn't you say? Yep, and this is Mr. Death's favorite holiday. Freddy's too. You know, we should have borrowed my father's lap. <laughs> Mr. Death and Mr. Krueger are cruising in the cattle. I like it. But I promised the all-American metal machine that it could go out for Halloween. Dave, you really are unnaturally attached to this jacked-up Chevy. Mr. Death warns Mr. Krueger to watch his mouth. Oh, really? What Wills really wanted to say was... Who do you think you are, Dave Walken? My family can trace its roots back to the Mayflower. Who the hell are you? But Wills didn't say it. Instead, he wished that his costume was real. He'd like to do a Freddy Krueger on Dade. Or a Jack the Ripper. He'd almost come as Jack the Ripper. He admired Jack the Ripper. A man after his own heart. Stalking the streets of London in the 1800s. Keeping an entire city locked in fear. Wills looked over at Dade broodingly. Dade could be unpredictable, not safe to confront. Better to get him from behind. Really? Really? Because Mr. Death isn't afraid of dying, but Mr. Cooper still has that option open. <laughs> Will's howl kept silent as Dade eased the Chevy up Cindy Moray's driveway. Jones was ready for the dance early. His costume consisted of putting on a cowboy hat. The rest already matched. And the hat was real, too. It would do for Halloween. He closed the door of his dark house without saying goodbye to anyone. His car, battered and nondescript, cranked to life with a mega-horse roar. <coughs> Appearances could be deceiving. Important to always remember that. Jones drove slowly down Main Street with his small, expensive shops. Point Harbor was a charming town, quaint, well-preserved. The foot of the street ran into a dock from which whaling ships had once set sail. 
From the dock, he could look out over the harbor, held between the land on one side and the long, curving, blunted point on the other that gave the town its name. Beyond the point, a row of rocks pitched up out of the ocean floor. Sometimes you could see lights out there, they said. Long lost ghost ships that have been caught by devilish mists and treacherous tides. And the rocks. The devil's teeth, they called them. In the old days, people used to scavenge the point for what washed ashore and bury their dead there. Cemetery Point. Long ago, before the area had become a playground for the rich, that's what the whole town had been called. Jones glanced out to the point as he turned and headed for the high school. In the school parking lot, he eased the car into the shadows and sat back to reconnoiter. A few people had already begun to drift into the gym for the Halloween dance. They'd all be there, of course, but the dance wasn't the thing. Cindy Moray's party afterwards was what really counted. Trendy Cindy and her too cool to live friends. Jones scanned the darkening sky and frowned. A full gothic moon was floating amid scudding clouds over the roof of the old school. It was spooky. Jones was annoyed with himself. He didn't like emotion. Feelings caused trouble. They caused you to imagine things. He didn't like this night. Didn't like anything about it. It was always tough being the new kid in town. Charity Webster was standing in front of her mirror admiring her witch's costume, a very unwitchy black lurex bodysuit with a short sequin tunic over it. She'd painted her red hair liberally with white, put on false fingernails of blood red. Downstairs, she heard the kitchen door bang shut. Her mother was home. Now she could go. When all was ready, she took one final look at herself before the glass. Will I have fun? Yes, I will. And who knew? She might. Charity was going to have a good time, even if it killed her. It was an unusually warm night for October, but the moon looked round and cool and seductive. Up and down the pumpkin-lit streets of Point Harbor, the last of the trick-or-treaters were making their way home. In the high school gym, the dance was grinding on. In the parking lot, Foy Villanova and Jane Wales leaned against a parked car and listened to the rhythms pounding out from within the gym doors. Jane tilted her face back and closed her eyes. What are you doing, Jane? Moon bathing? Mm-hmm. Jane opened her eyes and grinned. That was the nice thing about being with Foy. You could bask in the moonlight, and he didn't think you were being corny and romantic. On the other hand, a little romance wouldn't hurt. But Foy was not the one. Foy took a sip from his flask and offered her some. She shook her head. Suddenly, the back door to the gym opened, and Dave Walker moved towards them. Guys, give me a pull on that flask, man. I'm parched. Sure. <laughs> oh, that's bad stuff. Where's Cindy? Inside, I guess. Why? Jane, I do believe you're blushing. Or is it moonburn? <laughs> Leave me alone. <laughs> hey, that's some party hat, Foy. Who are you supposed to be? Merlin, the magician. <laughs> Mother thought he was supposed to be Dracula. <laughs> <laughs> well, sometimes people don't make mistakes when they make mistakes, you know. Please, walk and spares your Freudian witticisms. It makes sense. Uh, who are you supposed to be, Dave? Mr. Death, little <laughs> Dorothy. <laughs> but you can call me Death. <laughs> <laughs> Dance is dead. Oh, what? Hey, she was awful. Oh, Glad you approved, Jane. <laughs> what would you like for Christmas, little girl? <laughs> hey, Cindy's supposed to be meeting us here, isn't she? I yeah. mean, she, she did promise us a real Halloween party, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> on cue, Cindy appeared from the gym, one hand on Wills' arm and the other on the arm of the new guy, Jones. Laura and Charity emerged behind them. Okay, is everybody ready? Yeah. Yeah. Hey, trick 
trick or treat. Hey, Cindy, where is this party anyway? Yeah. yeah. Don't be so pushy. Yeah. The trick <laughs> will be to keep up with me. All right. <laughs> if you do, you get the treat. Let's go. <laughs> Cindy turned and headed off towards Dade's car. As everyone else obediently began to follow, Jones moved to Charity's shoulder. Do we trust her? Are you kidding? No. Coming, Jones! We'll be right there, Cindy. Can I ride with you, Jones? Sure, why not? Moments later, with Dade's car in the lead, a little convoy of grotesques set off on their way to the real Halloween party. Don't let them get too far ahead or we'll lose them. Don't worry, Chair. They won't get away. Anyway, why are you so afraid to be alone with me? I don't bite, you know. Jones. The one and only. Listen, how long have you known Cindy? Too long. How long is that? Only a guy could ask that question. Let's see. Well, my mother inherited our house here from her great aunt when I was seven, so ten years. Mm. What about Rick? Ten years. He was here when I got here, too. Jones, what about you? What about me? You know what I mean. I've known you since school started, but where are you from? What's the story? Well, I'm adopted, so I couldn't really say. Oh. But Jones, they've gone. Don't panic. They just turned off. Oh. Here, hang on. Any idea where we're going? We're headed out to Cemetery Point. You scared? No one comes out here anymore. The road's been sealed off for as long as I can remember. They say it's dangerous, something about erosion and the tides. Well, the road isn't sealed off now. Look. Jones pointed ahead. Sure enough, the metal gate in the barbed wire fence was propped open. Jones eased the car through, and they caught sight of taillights just ahead. Suddenly, Cher felt a thin shiver across her neck and shoulders, as if someone had laid a single burning finger against the nape of her neck. She reached up quickly, just as Jones pulled his hand back. Don't do that. You are afraid. That's okay. Being afraid's okay. Charity glanced at Jones. His eyes were fixed on the road ahead. It was hardly a road, more like a deeply rutted, nearly overgrown trail. Beside them, signs flickered by on the twisted, saltwater, stunted trees. Danger. No trespassing. Go back. Do you see those signs? Somebody means business. As Jones switched off his headlines, Charity's heart jumped. People got killed like this all the time, didn't they? All he had to do was reach out just like he had before. He turned toward her as smoothly as a cat. She pressed back against her door, hard. Jones? Jones leaned toward her, reached out. Jones, wait! <clears throat> <laughs> his hand clicked the door handle and the door opened, almost tumbling her out to the ground, pulling him with her so he lay almost on top of her. Cher felt his breath against her lips, then his lips on hers. Was it fear or pleasure that was making it so hard to breathe? Whatever it was, it was working. <laughs> A sound made Charity open her eyes. A wrong sound. For a flash, she couldn't focus. And a flash was all it took. The flash of moonlight on the axe blade coming down. <laughs> You're dead meat, Chair. It's a plastic axe. <laughs> you think that's funny, Rick? Well, it's not. No way. Boy, you should have seen your face. <laughs> Sometimes I just kill myself. Yeah, you're a real comedian, Carmack. Give me that. Hey, my axe. Play any more games like that, Santa Claus, and you'll hear from me. Oh, what are you going to do, Jones? Axe murder him? Shut up, Willie. Watch it, Carmack. Or what? You'll rip me to death with your Freddy Krueger fingernails? Hey, lighten up, okay? Uh, come on, it was a pretty decent joke. Admit it. You were scared witless. You wouldn't have the wit to know when to be scared. Hey, why are we standing around? This is a party. You're right, Lara. Right, let's unload the cars. Wills, you yeah. and Richard carry the cooler. Yeah. I'll be in charge of the music. Jones, get that box out of the trunk. Right. I got the blanket. When do we get stuck with the cooler? What is the time? Yeah, what's the matter, Freddy? You afraid you'll break your fingernails? Shove it. <laughs> Just do it, okay? Why aren't the girls carrying something? We're carrying the conversation. Very funny. <laughs> Come on, pick up your end of the cooler, Carmack. Whatever you say. Just, just warm, Freddy. <laughs> Where's Sydney? <laughs> Look! All eyes followed Lara's pointing finger. 
silhouetted against a dune beyond the clearing, a tall figure in a clean dress beckoned sepulchrally. Behind her, a faint path gleamed like an old scar in the scrub grass skirting the woods. <laughs> Yo, Cindy! The figure beckoned again and turned and glided into the darkness of the trees without answering. Lara put her hand on Dade's arm. Creepy. Come on, guys. Let's do like the lady wants. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Fun. yeah. Come on, hey, watch your step, Ray. This is so heavy. heavy. Oh, poor baby. This is nothing but a big sand dune with trees. <laughs> Whose idea was this anyway? You were in on this Dade, weren't you? How much longer do we have to walk? Uh, you don't mind a little walk with death, do you, Freddy? <laughs> We've got a cooler full of goodies. We'll all be nice and warm when we get there. <laughs> uh, it's really very warm for this time of year. Not cold at all. See, Wills, a little walk with death doesn't leave Jane cold. <laughs> Just the opposite, sounds like. I wouldn't let Cindy find out, Jane. She doesn't like to share. That's low class, Wills. Oh, listen. Charity defends her best friend. I don't Whoa. think you should talk about Cindy like that, Wills. She never talks about you. <laughs> <laughs> At last, the path opened into another clearing. They'd reached Cemetery Point, a high, rocky spit, pounded by the ocean on one side, gnawed by the currents of the sound on the other. A crumbling stone wall enclosed the cemetery. Inside the wall, a crazy dance of weathered gravestones and monuments waited. And just outside it stood Cindy. Welcome to Cemetery Point. Happy Halloween! The moon passed behind the clouds, and for a moment, they all stood silently. Then they moved forward to join Cindy. At the edge of the graveyard was a huge pile of driftwood. Foy knelt down beside it. <laughs> okay. Let me do a little magic here. Who's got a match? Oh, yeah, light my fire, Merlin. Here, I've got a lighter. Thanks. Oh, Jane, the truth about Dorothy, she smokes. Or um, is it only when you're not in Kansas, Jane? Very funny, Cindy. It happens to be my father's. Come on, Jane. Let's spread the blankets. Okay. A moment later, the driftwood at the base of the pile took flame from Jane's lighter, and the fire leapt to life. Chair stepped back from the circle of firelight and turned. The grave markers made her uneasy. Tilted at their crazy angles behind the low, crumbling stone wall, they seemed to be dancing in the erratic firelight. I don't know if this is such a good idea, Cindy. So, leave. <laughs> Whoa, yes! yes! Funny if something held back. Dance chair? Sure. Moving with Jones to the beat of the music, Chair found herself thinking that this kind of dancing was probably illegal. Jones was moving slow, holding her very close. She pulled back. They had danced to the edge of the circle of light, and she turned impulsively toward a gap in the crumbling wall. Smiling, Jones followed her into the graveyard among the shadowy stones. It's weird, this place. It's a graveyard. Yeah. Hey, look at this stone. Believe taken by the sea, may God have mercy on his soul. Sounds like there was some doubt about the mercy part. Maybe the drowning, too. Well, he's buried in the graveyard. You can't get buried in a graveyard if the church says it's not okay. You mean like suicides? Right. That's still true, isn't it? If you commit suicide, then you can't get buried in holy ground? For some churches. Hey, here's a good one. Born on the tides, up to heaven. <laughs> kind of nice. <laughs> These are all sailors, I guess. Hey, look at this one. All on its own outside the wall. Asleep but not at rest, may death bring her peace. What does that mean? What do you think it means? <sighs> Sounds like she got zombieized. Zombieized? Hmm. Jones caught her hand in his and pressed it. With his other hand, he lightly caressed her shoulder. As she moved toward him, Charity forgot all about the tombstone. 
For the second time that night, she forgot to think at all. Time passed and the music cranked on. Everyone kept drinking, dancing, and partying, and their shadows leapt and twisted and merged with the other shadows beyond the fire. Rick was leaning on the low wall, drinking a beer and looking on. Jane glanced at him as she sat down on the blanket, while Foy wandered over to the CD player. Seeing Jane alone, Dade left Cindy digging through the cooler and walked over to squat down beside her. So, are we having fun yet? Yeah. So why aren't you dancing? Jane didn't answer for a moment. Together, they watched the figures gyrating in the firelight. Then Jane's eyes strayed back to the cooler. Wills had come up to Cindy and was saying something to her. Cindy was looking up at Wills, a little smile on her face. Dade followed Jane's gaze. <laughs> Brave man. Doesn't it bother you? What? About Cindy and Wills. That he, you know, broke up with her and she was so... Unwrapped? Nah. Besides, there's at least two sides to every story. I'm sorry. I, I shouldn't have asked. No problem. The problem is... Before Jane could answer, Dade caught her hand and pulled her up. Jane had never danced with Dade before. It made her uncomfortable to stand so close to him. Excited. Dade was dangerous. Everyone knew that. There were rumors of drink and fights and marathon parties. But no one knew for certain. She liked that. Suddenly, she turned to find Cindy beside her. Arms crossed, eyes blazing. Well, well, look at little Dorothy dancing with death. Aren't you a brave little girl? <laughs> For a moment, Jane was almost afraid. Then Dade swung her away from Cindy, away from looks that could kill. Cindy threw back her head and laughed. Then she turned and walked over to Rick. Imperiously, she grabbed Rick's hand and swept into the graveyard toward a low marble crypt. Come on, Rick. <laughs> What's your game, Cindy? Lift up to the top of this thing. What's she doing? Right. As Chair and Jones wandered back into the firelight, Rick lifted Cindy up to the top of the crypt. Then he scrambled up beside her. Cindy pulled him to her and began to sway to the music. Come on, Santa, let's boogie. Oh, no. You shouldn't do that, Cindy. It's disrespectful. Shouldn't I, Jane? Who asked you? Cindy, come down! <laughs> What is the matter with you guys? Afraid of a few dead people. <laughs> Listen, this is the first party they have had in an eternity. They are happy. <laughs> yeah. Grateful. Uh -huh. The grateful dead. Oh. <laughs> Get it? That sucks, Carmax. <laughs> what? Cindy! Behind you is the What? What? Something <laughs> Breaking through the trees at the edge of the woods, Georgina Butler strolled into the firelight. Cindy's eyes narrowed to furious slits. And as Georgie's date walked out of the shadows behind her, Cindy's lip curled into a snarl. Smiling, Cindy Moray's older brother, Dorian, dressed as an elegant pirate captain, walked up to Georgie and put his arm around her shoulders. You, what are you doing here? We're not late, are we? Hey, Dave, any brew in that cooler? Yeah. Yeah, help yourself, guys. <laughs> I, what are you doing here? Dorian invited me. Yeah, and I invited myself. <coughs> I figured you'd just forgotten. Here you go. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> oh, 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 oh,
put something else on. Yeah. Yeah. Move it, Walton. Let's do something different. Oh, I love games. Is that what you had in mind? <laughs> I have an idea, Rick. Since we have such a special guest, why don't you just play the game you usually play with her? Hot potato, isn't it? <laughs> How about ghost stories? Oh, huh? Right. Right. Unless everyone else is chicken. Oh, no. no, let's do it. Okay, we'll tell ghost stories. Yeah, all right. Okay. You go first, stories. Rick. Yeah, Rick. When everyone had settled comfortably on the blankets, Rick leaned forward and began. Go on, make it a good one, Rick. <laughs> yeah, don't worry, no problem. Once upon a time, a couple. Charity had heard this old story a million times. It was regular Girl Scout material. But she felt a faint thrill of fear in spite of herself. I don't like this graveyard. We shouldn't be telling ghost stories here on Halloween. Oh, that stupid chair. Everyone here has been dead and gone since the turn of the century. They have nothing to do with you. And there's no such thing as a ghost. Foy, she noticed, was holding Jane's hand in an absent-minded way. Jane kept shifting restlessly, looking down, glancing sideways. Now Chair caught another one of Jane's fleeting glances. Towards Dade. Dade? Wow. Has Cindy noticed? Oh, don't let her see you, Jane, or she'll have your blood. Our door, he found a bloody hook. <laughs> a tried and true story, Rick. The hook, the car door, the whole thing. Great story, anyway. I like it. It's not so scary if you know how it ends. Hey, Jones, you got any stories? Yeah. Nothing you haven't heard. I've got one. Far out, Dorian. Let's hear it. Whoa. Once upon a time, there was a vampire. A vampire on wheels, if you know what I mean. <laughs> this vampire couldn't keep her teeth off other people's property or other people. She liked to take what wasn't hers. So she started getting fat. And then she couldn't catch the people anymore. So she had to go to this graveyard and suck on the dead people. Gross! No, it's boring. Wait, I haven't finished. I haven't finished. Anyway, our fat, greedy vampire made a big mistake. Because all the people in the graveyard weren't quite dead yet. One corner of the graveyard was for the undead. And she dug up one of the undead, and it was a vampire. And it bit her. And you know what happens when a vampire takes a direct hit from another vampire? What? The old vampire was freed. And this new bogus vampire got buried in his grave. She's there to this day, buried alive. And no one will save her because no one loves her. Or ever will. What's love got to do with it? That's a disgusting story, Dorian. You guys go too fast for me. Hey, it's almost midnight. Oh, oh I know. Let's all hold hands and see if we can contact the dead. Oh. You know, like a seance. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah Anything yeah, to grab onto a guy's bod, huh, Georgie? <laughs> you afraid, Cindy? Try me. All right. You guys take hands and form a circle around the fire. Okay, do yeah, 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 yeah. yeah okay. Do it, Jones. Ready? Go for it, Spider Woman. <laughs> all right. This is All Hallows' Eve. We call to you, spirits trapped beyond life. Lost spirits who are doomed to wander the earth. We call on you. To arrive! No! Jones, you broke the circle! You ruined it! Oh, Come on, everybody, oh. let's dance some more. Oh, this no. night is getting too weird. Yeah. Suddenly, Charity felt the whole point tilt fractionally. She looked around. No one else seemed to notice. Chair lost her balance. She felt the tremor through her body. Dark, like pain. Pain remembered. She looked at Jones. Jones? It's time to go, Chair. You felt it, didn't you? Let's go now. Hey, where are you going? Off to do a little charity work, Jones? Or were you just going to play hide and seek? Oh, what a good idea. Hey, what time is it? Three minutes till midnight. Excellent. Whoa. Everybody, shh. Listen, when I clap my hands, I want all the girls to hide, and then I will count to 20, 
and the guys can come look for you. Woo! Yeah. Hey, what does that make you, Cindy? One of the guys? I'll do the counting for you, Cindy. Then you can hide too. All right, Dave. Hey, why don't you come? Wouldn't it be great to let Cindy hide for that? Yeah. <laughs> this time, the tremor was more distinct. Cher felt it through the soles of her feet, up her spine, into her heart. Jones! Run, Cher. Run back to the car. Don't stop. Don't look back. <laughs> Jones gave her a push. What about you, she wanted to cry. What about everyone else? But suddenly she felt the earth pitch as if it were about to open and swallow her whole. Cher ran for the woods. At the edge of the clearing, she had a last glimpse of Dade, standing high on a crypt in his black and silver death outfit, like a priest in some ancient evil rite. She didn't wait to hear him clap his hands. She was running for the cover of the trees. <laughs> Go, girls! One, two, three, four! Better hide good, you guys! Five, six, seven! Hey, Merlin, use your magic powers and tell me where they're hiding. <laughs> use your eyes, Dave. You haven't got them closed, have you? Who told you? Hey, that isn't Eight, fair, Walker. Nine, ten, eleven! Careful with the fire, Wills, or you'll melt your fingernails. Then we'll have to call you Freddy the Unready. <laughs> Good day. 12, 13, 14, 15, 16! Rick? Yeah? You're not doing what I think you're doing on those graves, are you, Richard? <laughs> oh, man, you're gross. What do you think, man? <laughs> Stop it. You really are a psycho Santa. 17, 18, 19. Uh, just for the record, you guys, I plan on taking my time out there in the dark. Oh, you don't have to spell it out for us, Greg. We get the idea. 20! Mm. Ready or not? Here we come! Girls, death's coming to get you! Yeah. <laughs> Cindy crouched beneath a broken-off monument, smiling to herself. When Dade got closer, she was going to jump out and give him the scare of his life. She could hear him now. Or maybe it wasn't Dade. That was an interesting possibility, too. Jane knelt down miserably in the shadows of the cold stones. She should have done what Cher had done and run for the woods. None of them had except chair. A shadow passed. Dade? Then she thought about all the shadows around her. Shadows of tombstones. Shadows of the dead. Oh, why did they always end up doing what Cindy wanted to do? Foy gave his sorcerer's robe a yank. He kept catching on the underbrush. Slowly, he skirted the edge of the graveyard. Up ahead, he thought he saw a figure crouched in the shadow of the churchyard wall. Yes, he moved toward it. Georgie peered cautiously over the top of the angel's half-furled wing. Where was Dorian? Or Dade? Mm, wouldn't that put Cindy in a twist? Her gaze swept the firelit clearing. Jones wasn't standing there anymore. Had he headed out into the woods after Cher? Stupid Charity. No one would ever find her in those woods. Someone was coming. She slid back down. Rick didn't care how much noise he made. It didn't matter who he found, unless it was Cindy, and she was glad to see him, and feeling like making some trouble to pass the time which was not a bad idea. And Dave wouldn't care, would he? Dorian found a flat, worn-down stone and sat down on it. He lit a cigarette and waited. He wasn't about to go thrashing through a graveyard. He had better things to do. Will stumbled over something and cursed. Damn graveyard. Stupid game. He wrinkled his nose. Something stank. Then he saw the deeper shadow on the ground ahead of him. Had someone been digging? He stopped uneasily. Was that what smelled so bad? An open grave? Then he remembered that the graveyard was long unused. 
Whatever had been buried wouldn't smell anymore. Maybe something had fallen in, an animal or something, and hadn't been able to get out. Something made William Lawrence Howell turn. Something was standing behind him. Something big. Then the moon came out. What Will saw wasn't what he expected. He threw up his hand in a futile gesture of defense. The great glittering blade hooked him under the chin and wrenched sideways. The boy, dressed like Freddy Krueger, was in shock long before it was finished. He never knew he was dead. Lara was getting bored. Why hadn't anyone found her yet? She waited a few seconds longer. Then she jumped to her feet. There was a movement in the far back corner of the graveyard where the wall stopped. Lara raised the hem of her dress and walked lightly across the graves. The moon came out suddenly. She saw something flash in its light and heard a sound, a sort of muffled ripping sound. Slowly she rounded the corner of the wall. Willis? <gasps> Breathless, Charity ran on blindly through the darkness. Branches slapped her face. She'd lost the path. If she could just find the edge of the dune, she thought, she could follow it to the clearing where the cars were parked. Ladies, here we come. <laughs> she stopped to catch her breath and heard something crashing through the woods behind her. Jones? Or one of the others? Charity didn't move. She tried not to breathe. Then the crashing stopped, and the darkness was complete. It was midnight now. High midnight on All Hallows' Eve on Cemetery Point. Then the screams began. Cher put her hands over her ears and ran, not caring what was behind her, not caring what was ahead. She ran blindly, punching her way through the trees, until something caught her by the ankle. And the darkness came up to meet her. Then, out of the darkness, a vision began to form of another time, another place, familiar. Charity felt herself standing in the water. The water was warm. The waves pulled at her ankles and thighs. The long skirt of her dress twisted like seaweed around her. Out beyond, the shadowy devil's teeth grinned jaggedly. Something was sailing there in the dark and heaving waters, sailing safely among those teeth. Something was hunting out there, and she was waiting for it. Then the water turned to ice around her thighs, and the wind laid cold, wet hands against her cheeks and froze her breath, and she couldn't move. It had come. Chair? Charity? It's all right, it's me. <laughs> Charity opened her eyes. The moon was shining. She was lying in soft sand. The branches of trees were silhouetted against the sky above her. Jones was leaning over her. Can you get up? Yes. Come on. Let's get out of here. Georgie's voice. Yes. Now Cher remembered. She'd been running. Someone had screamed. They'd been playing a game. Is the game over? Come on, Cher. Here, lean on me. I'm fine. Really. They moved towards the cars. Someone stepped ahead of Cher and opened a door. Other figures hurried by her. Grotesque figures. Santa Claus. And a spider woman. And a pirate captain. Halloween. That's right, it was Halloween. And that was Jones. And Jones's car. What happened, Jones? Right. Oh, for God's sake, let's just get yeah. in the car! Come on. Right, let's move. Grabbing the dash to keep her balance, Chair turned to look back. In the seat behind her, outlined in the headlights of the car behind them, sat Lara and Cindy and Foy. 
Where's Jane? In one of the other cars. Dades. And the others? What about... Georgie Porgy is with Dorian, okay? And Rick is probably with them if he isn't with Dade. And Wills? What about Will? Oh. He's dead. Oh. Uh -huh. Wills is dead. Dead? Yeah. For the first time, Cher noticed the dark stains on Lara's pink princess dress. That can't be blood, she thought. This is a joke. A bad Halloween joke. Cher, Sorry. he was ripped up pretty bad. How do you know that, Jones? Oh, that's right. You stayed. You stayed and looked at him. That's better than running away. Wills was on the ground. Laura was over him screaming. I pulled her away and tried to see if he still had a pulse or anything. He was still moving. Sometimes that happens even after a person is dead. Stop it! All of you! What happened? We don't know, Cher. The streets of Point Harbor were almost empty now, but jack-o'-lantern still burned in the windows. Jones turned down the street by City Hall and eased the car to a stop outside a low, brightly lit building. That's the police station. What did you expect, Cindy? We have to report a murder. Charity sat on one of the small, downfilled chairs in Jane's immaculately kept bedroom. Across the room, Jane lay on the bed on her stomach, a pillow under her chin. Both girls were exhausted. They'd been at the police station until almost dawn. As they'd left, Jared looked out toward Cemetery Point. Searchlights winked through the graying darkness. No one had believed them at first, but they believed them now. Only Charity still wasn't quite sure what had happened. Who could have done it, Jane? And why? It was one of us, wasn't it? I didn't say that. It could have been anybody out there. Some bum, maybe. Or some crazy person who knew about the party and got there first. Or followed us out, like Georgie and Dorian. Yeah. Did you notice anything, Jane? No. Uh, don't, don't think about the whole thing. Just try and remember the details. Mm. Well... I know the way, oh. Hodges. Don't worry. Cindy, <laughs> what are you doing? Oh, well, chair. I thought you'd be here. Cindy was pale. Traces of black liner still ringed her eyes, and her mouth was chapped at the corners where the vampire teeth had rested. Without waiting to be invited, Cindy dropped into the other chair and pulled her feet up under her. We were talking about the murder. It kind of ruined your party, didn't it? You could say that. It certainly spoiled all the fun. Fun. Huh. I thought you'd be here. Both of you. That's why I came. Why? Because Wills is dead, and maybe someone might think it was my fault. Is it? Chair. It's okay. You're a witch chair, but at least you're consistent. In a funny way, I trust you. I stick to trusting my friends. Friends? What friends? But Laura's... Laura's home doing the grief number with the help of the doc's prescriptions. And you're here. Why? The cops think I set the whole thing up. The party, the games... The murder? Yes, to get even with Wills, to pay him back for us splitting. Someone told them all about it. I didn't. You wouldn't. People like you, Jane, don't gossip, and Cher wouldn't either, because she doesn't like me. <laughs> sort of like a weird code of honor, am I right? I didn't say anything to the cops. See what I mean? But, Cindy, everyone knew about you and Wills. They said you'd had a big fight. Wills had a big mouth. All he wanted was to be somebody famous, even if it was only for going out with me. You were just using him, too. So, I'm not on this earth to get married and have babies. And anyway, it was mutual. I just wish I'd dumped him first. <sighs> Cindy. Hmm. I could have killed him, but I didn't. Now I've got to prove that I didn't, and the only way to prove it is to find out who did. Jones was thinking about murder. How easy it was. How people got away with it. It was Monday morning, and he was sitting in his car, parked at the Overlook, by the Back Bay Road. He'd been there all night. On the night of the murder, he'd come here, too had watched the searchlights flickering out on the point until the sun came up. But last night, it had been dark and still, lit only by the waning moon. The cops would have the point roped off now, scene of the crime. A car pulled into the overlook and stopped behind him. Jones watched in the rearview mirror as the driver got out and sauntered towards the passenger side of his car. It was Dade. I've been thinking. Yeah. Say you wanted to off someone, Jones. How would you do it? Charity was dreaming again. She knew she was dreaming. She knew the dream. 
She'd been there before, that night on the point when she'd been running away from Cindy's party. But this time, she wasn't in the water. She was on the dunes above, looking out to sea. Under the waning moon, the devil's teeth glistened with unholy light. The somber, heavy wool dress she was wearing didn't warm her. She was cold to the heart. But he was out there, waiting for her to call him to her. They would say she had a demon lover, but it wasn't that. He had taken everything that she had loved, everything that had mattered, and that had changed her. She felt a power rising through her veins, an immortal power. She didn't know where it came from or why. She didn't care anymore. Whatever it was, she would use it to kill him. And if he would not die, then it would be a fight beyond death. She would wear out eternity before she rested. Lifting her arms, she called to him. Cher woke in her bed. Her arms were raised as if she wanted to pull the darkness to her and hold it tight, like a lover. No. No. What was happening to her? Why? She had to stop it. She had to fight it. She was afraid, mortally afraid. It's not death I'm afraid of. I'm not afraid of dying. I'm afraid of something worse. Cruising down Back Bay Road on his way to the high school, Foy watched Dade walk and slide into Jones's car. He almost stopped, but something about the whole setup made him keep going. Jones and Dade, what were they up to? At the point, Jones had been the ice of them all. The first one to reach Lara, to pull her away, kneeling down beside Wills' body and calmly checking for a pulse. How had he even known where to look in all that... mess? Someone had done a Jack the Ripper on William Lawrence Howell. <sighs> How ironic. Wills had always been such a fan of Jack's. Foy turned into the school parking lot and felt the eyes of the kids turn to stare. Monday was going to be murder. Charity was in the gloomy basement of the Point Harbor Public Library. She'd come straight there after school. Now, pulling a dusty bundle of old newspapers off the lower shelf in the back of the stacks, she carried it to the wooden table in the corner. It was quiet. The library staff were all upstairs, and Cher was alone in the basement. Arranging the papers before her, she sat down and began to read. From time to time, she scribbled brief notes in a small black notebook. She'd started 40 years back. That seemed far enough. Maybe there was a pattern. Maybe someone had killed like this before. It couldn't have been Cindy. No. She didn't like Cindy, but she didn't think she was a killer either. It helped to be busy. To think she might find something. It helped to keep her from thinking about Wills' death. The light at the small street-level windows turned gray as she zipped it through one stack of newspapers after another but she found nothing of interest, nothing to support her theory. Finally, Cher gathered up the last bundle and trundled it to the back of the shadowy stacks. She knelt to shove the newspapers back in place on the lower shelf and suddenly felt a shifting in the air, a flutter of the dim light. She wasn't alone. Cher straightened up slowly, tried not to breathe. Who's there? I know you're there. Who is it? It's me. Oh, Jones, what are you doing here? I found this notebook you left on the table. Oh, Interesting stuff. Well, not very. Give it back. Thank you. You had no right to look in that book. It was open. Chair pushed past him and headed back to the table, where her leather shoulder satchel hung over the chair. Without looking at Jones, she shoved the book deep inside and hoisted the satchel to her shoulder. Hey, wait a minute, Chair. I thought we were friends. I'm leaving now. Listen, I'm sorry it was open. I only looked at the open pages. Well, you shouldn't have. No, but I'm glad I did. Why? We obviously think alike. 
You're doing research on Will's death, aren't you? Looking up other crimes that happened around Point Harbor that might be similar? So? The night Wills died, you knew something was going to happen, too. You felt it. Whatever I felt had nothing to do with what happened. Chair, you don't trust me, do you? Who killed Wills, Jones? Tell me that. I can't do that. You know, don't you? You know the name, Jones. Fine. Play the game. Keep the name. Excuse me, please. Chair? What? It's not a game, Chair. Then you won't mind if I don't play by the rules. said he would. Hadn't he? Well, she'd had a little too much to drink, of course. She didn't remember the whole evening all that clearly. Georgina poured herself some vodka from her father's supply. She took a sip and tried to think clearly now, her pale blue eyes squinting with the effort. The cops had not been nice to her. They'd treated her differently than they'd treated the others. But she told them what she knew about Cindy and Will's and the whole soap opera, the young and the rich. What did the others said about her? They always talked about her, thought they were better than she was. What had happened to Wills was the least that any of them deserved. <laughs> Weren't they scared now? Scared it was one of them. Well, it served them right. They'd all be sorry someday about how they treated her. She finished her drink and picked up the phone. <laughs> Georgie, I don't think this is such a good idea. Just drive, will you, Dorian? Or my old man will come crackerjacking out the door telling me it's a school night. Well, isn't it? Dorian! All right, I'll drive. You have anything to drink? Nice thought, but I'm driving. Don't be stupid, Dorian. It's a school night for me, too. Yeah? You're on what? Halloween break from college. Why did you come home, Dorian? You called and made me an offer I couldn't refuse. I'm flattered you decided to stay on. Or maybe the cops asked you to. And maybe they didn't. There's a six-pack in the bag behind the seat. Oh, for me? How sweet. Hold it down, okay? I don't want my license pulled for having an open beer in the car with a minor attached to it. Mm, you don't mind having a minor in your car doing other things. That's different, Georgie. This is big time. Bogus, Dorian. It's just as illegal, isn't it? It's crazy to come out here again after what happened. Why are we doing this? Because I'm tired of sitting around. And because I like a little thrill. You remember Nancy Drew, girl detective? Well, I thought it might be fun to look for some clues, you know? It's a mega ditz idea, Georgie. The whole point is sealed off, for one thing. It's almost dark for another. It won't be dark for another hour. What's the matter? Scared? No. They think Cindy did it. <laughs> she's capable of it, don't you think? I mean, she's got such a bad temper. And she's strong. What about it, Georgie? Why do you always get so bent over Cindy? What's with you and her? Look, we're going back to the scene of the crime. You're going to get to be Nancy Drew for an hour, so just be quiet. Just as I thought. The gate's locked again, and there's police tape sealing the whole area off. Oh, what now? Can't you walk? Come on, Dorian. Help me. <sighs> Here. Hold this can and pull those strands of barbed wire out of the way so I can get through. Uh, oh. <sighs> Here's your beer. Come on! Hey, hold the wire up, will you? And don't let those barbs rip my leather jacket or your dead meat. <laughs> <sighs> okay. Start looking for clues. For clues, yeah, sure. If I see any suspicious trees, I'll run right over and make a citizen's arrest. Dorian! It's so quiet. Doesn't this give you the creeps? Oh, no. It's exciting. 
When they reached the clearing by the graveyard, they stopped by the charred remains of the fire. The cooler's gone. I guess the cops took it. Come on, Dorian. Wills was found back this way. Uh, look, Georgie, it's getting dark. Oh, you're such a chicken, Dorian. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. What's in this for me? Well, what do you want to be in it? Tell you what. Come with me and I'll show you. What a bad little girl you are. <laughs> You're really getting off on this, aren't you? Nothing ever happens in Point Harbor, Dorian. Now something has. Does that do anything for you? Murder doesn't. Come on, Dorian. It's just over here. There! Oh, wow. Look at all that blood. Satisfied? This is sick, Georgie. Look, Dorian. Wills fell backwards. Laura must have knelt down here. That means whoever stabbed him, stabbed him from the front. That doesn't necessarily mean you fall backwards. Then maybe he was tripped. Or dragged. Do you see any drag marks, Georgie? Uh, Look, whatever clues there were, the police already found them. Georgie! All right. We're going, we're going. About time. Hey! Kiss? Mm. Mm. Georgie, mm. it's almost dark. We gotta go. Now? Come on! Wait! My beer! Oh. Well, that was smart. Why don't you just leave a note saying you were here? I could have dropped it Halloween night. You're the only one who knows different. Mm -hmm. All right, Dorian, let's have some fun. Dorian didn't want to admit how relieved he was. If they walked quickly, they'd be out of there before it got too dark. He was wrong. The darkness in the woods was already complete. He picked up his pace. Hey, wait up. I've got on boots with heels, okay? Come on. You're scared, aren't you? You're really scared. Will you hurry up? <laughs> What a cowardly little boy. They were in the clearing now, where they had parked before. Dorian looked back. Georgina was standing at the edge of the trees, her arms folded, one hip thrust out provocatively. Don't you want to stay for a while, little boy? Georgina ran one hand down her hip. For a moment, Dorian almost turned back. Then he heard it of sounds in the undergrowth. Huh? Run, Georgie! Dorian? Hurry! Dorian crashed forward to the gate. The barbed wire tore at his hands, at his jacket. For a moment it felt as if the wire were holding on to him. He gave a strangled cry and tore free. <laughs> Come on, Georgie! Come on! <laughs> But Georgie wasn't running. She wasn't hurrying at all. In slow motion, she turned her head. Dorian! Something dark leapt out of the woods. There was a glint of burning metal light. Then Georgie jumped, as if she were rising up to meet the glittering blade. Dorian raced the car down the rutted roadway. He didn't look back. He didn't see Georgie fall. He tore down the track, heedless of the branches scoring the side of the car. When Charity got home from the library, she went immediately to her room. Shutting the door behind her, she slung her satchel on the desk and reached inside for her notebook. She found it, and another book. A pale, rusty-colored book, faded with age. Nothing was written on the outside, Inside, the writing was faded to an even paler rust. Where had it come from, she wondered. Charity fluttered the pages. The book smelled old, as if the pages had not been turned in a long, long time. Chair felt the hair rise on her neck. The book was an old whaler's journal, written before the turn of the century. Across the title page, 
in the same faded rusty script was the title of Darkness and Its Minions. In spite of herself, she began to read and felt the chills running down her back as she read of ghost ships and monster sharks, of superstition and blood and death, a history of it, a history that led at last to Point Harbor. Only it wasn't Point Harbor then, it was Cemetery Point. bit of land that enfoldeth the harbor, just beyond as grave a stretch of treacherous water and hidden rock as was ever known to man, being called the Devil's Teeth. There was more. The sudden closing of Cemetery Point, barely mentioned in the local newspaper she'd read earlier at the library, was explained here in the unidentified author's words. No one went to Cemetery Point now, the author noted, to bury their dead. They chose the newer graveyard inland, for, as the faded writing testified, upon that once hallowed land there now be hauntings. A fiend ship doth sail there among the rocks and tides where no ship can pass, and doth lure other mortal ships to immortal death, that it might gather souls from proper burial. For those who search the shore after a ship goeth down find no bodies whole, but only parts thereof, rendered thus by no earthly means. Some do say that the master of the fiendship be an evil, dark creature escaped from England by reason of foul, murderous acts committed there in that country, and thus driven forth to our shores having devoured his crew in feasts of blood. And some do say that the thing which waiteth upon Cemetery Point cannot be destroyed, that it hath powers to fly, to mimic form and life and shadow, and to suck from the heart all that is hidden there, that if it be not stopped, it shall grow stronger still, but none have come upon the means to stop it, not one yet having seen its face and lived. Chair swallowed and felt her dry mouth. There was one final entry, the handwriting suddenly shrunken, as if written by a shaken, aging hand. I have seen her there. She hath died outside godliness, for she moves yet upon the land and water. Howsomever, I do not believe she did make tryst and pact with the fiend. What was buried was not buried aright. There is no peace for wronged blood. She was beautiful once. With this, the journal ended abruptly. There was no more. What the account described wasn't possible, Cher told herself. Surely what had happened was that someone had found this book and had used it to stage Wills's murder. But what was it doing in her pack? How had it gotten there? Then Cher remembered Jones standing there in the shadows in the library basement. And suddenly it all seemed very easy. Cindy was driving. She'd started out driving aimlessly, but after a few minutes she found herself bringing the car to a halt in the drive of Lara's house. What am I doing here, she thought. She rang the front doorbell. Moments later, she was standing in Lara's bedroom. Lara was sitting by the window. The curtains were drawn and the room was in near darkness. Lara? Lara? What? It's me, Cindy. Remember me? I'm fine. Thanks for stopping by. Well, and I can go now, is that it? Come on, Laura, knock it off. What's going on here? What's going on? 
Wills is dead. I was there. So was I, and you weren't any more in love with him than I was. There's blood all over my dress. Blood all over me. So get a new dress. Take a bath. Come on, Laura. This is the kind of thing Georgie would do. Melodrama 101. Why are you here? Why are you? You gonna hide out until it's all over? Yes. Why? Because... Laura... Because I saw who killed Wills. What? And I don't want him to kill me. Back in her car, Cindy thought about Laura. She had handled it all wrong. Laura had suddenly gone silent. Go away was all she would say. Nothing more. Maybe she's too scared. But who did Laura see? What did she see? Maybe Laura did it. After all, she had all that blood on her dress. What if she didn't get it kneeling down beside the body? Wait a minute, what am I thinking? Laura, a hatchet murderer? Cindy, get real. The car purred along. No one knew where she was. Not that anyone cared. Her parents were out partying for charity at some big bucks a plate dinner. Her brother was God knows where. My brother, where is Dorian? Now he is someone who is capable of murder. <laughs> yeah, yeah, maybe Dorian did it. When Cindy got home, it was late. Her parents' Continental was still out. So was Dorian's BMW. Cindy slotted her car into its space, powering the garage door closed behind her. She'd just gotten out of her car when she heard Dorian's car arriving. She stepped back in the shadows and waited as the garage door went back up. Driving like a bat out of hell, Dorian slammed the car into the last space at the far end of the garage and screeched to a halt. She watched as Dorian staggered out of the car, his breath coming in rasps. Then he bolted out of the garage like the devil himself was following. Cindy stepped forward from the shadows. The lights from the police patrol car swept the Cemetery Point gate as it pulled to a halt outside it. The two officers inside peered ahead in the darkness. Something wasn't right. The officer in the passenger seat reached for her flashlight. What do you think, Harris? See anything? I can't tell, Sarge. Looks like the barbed wire's been stretched a bit in the gate. We better check, I guess. Yeah, take a look. I'll radio in. Car 21 to Central. Go ahead, Unit 21. Yeah, we're at the gate to Cemetery Point. Looks like somebody might have been in there again. We're going to take a look around. Roger, 21. Be careful. Do you require backup? No, I don't think so. If we do, you'll hear from us. 10-4 for now. Roger, 21. Keep us posted. 10-4. How about it, Harris? Find anything? I'm not sure, Sarge. Look at this. Something's caught on the barbed wire. What is it? Leather. A strip of leather. Looks like a piece from a leather jacket. Yeah, it wasn't here before. She flashed her bright light through the wire back into the shadows. All around them was nothing but silent, eerie darkness. I'm going to take a look. Here, hold this wire up for me, will you? And watch my back. You hear me? Yeah, I hear you. Sure glad there are two of us here tonight. Well, there were 11 of them to begin with. Who would be stupid enough to come out here after something like that? I don't know. Thrill seekers, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> she turned her flashlight to a new direction of darkness, swept it again, and froze. Something lay motionless in the white beam. Something horrible. Oh, my God! Sarge, get over here, quick! Cindy stood outside the door of Dorian's bedroom, listening. From the time he had entered and locked his door, there hadn't been a sound from within. Dorian? Dorian, I know you're in there. Go away, Cindy. Don't you think you've done enough? I think we need to have a little talk about what happened tonight. It's unlocked. What do you want, Cindy? What did happen tonight, Dorian? Nothing. Nothing? Where'd you go? Out. <gasps> Who'd you go with? Nobody. Oh, and you didn't do anything. I drove around. Well, you must have hit something, because there are scratches all over your car and sand all over your tires. <clears throat> Remember, Dorian? Remember when I was five and you were seven? Remember how you locked me in the trunk in the attic? You're lying. No, 
it's the truth. I was there for hours, alone, in the dark. You'd think I'd be afraid of the dark after that, wouldn't you, Dorian? But it didn't work out that way. Because what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. I came back for you. It was a joke. A joke. What you tried was murder. Dorian, what are you saying? I locked you in that closet because I was afraid of you. Then, did you think I would do to you what you did to me, that I wouldn't let you out? But the fire... The fire was an accident, Dorian. It was the fire department that let me out. I told them you were there. I saved your life. You should thank me. Get out. And I've been the one they've blamed ever since. Not you. Me. Get out. I'm going. But, um, if I were you, big brother, I wouldn't let anybody else see the state of your car. They might get the wrong idea. Jane felt tired and afraid and alone. All day at school, everyone kept watching, waiting. Foy was acting weird, like he wasn't there, and Cher wasn't even home. Jane didn't have anyone to talk to, so she'd come out for a walk. Then Dade pulled up beside her at the curb. Jane! Jane, please! Go away, Dade. Leave me alone. Jane, you shouldn't be out so late alone. It's not safe. Janie. What do you want? I'll walk with you. Unless you'll come for a ride. Come on, what do you say? Does Cindy know where you are? No. And I don't know where she is, either. All right. Let's go for a ride. Where do you want to go to? Far, far away. Somewhere that isn't here. Janie, every place turns into here sooner or later. Not always. I won't be here forever. And wherever I go, it's going to be different. I'm going to be different. Changing the scenery don't change the performer. Maybe I just don't want to perform anymore. Good. I'm tired of performers. <laughs> You're strange, Dave. <laughs> wait till you get to know me. I don't want to wait, Dave. I want to know you now. They were parked in the Overlook, opposite Cemetery Point. Jane had a brief moment to think about Halloween and Cemetery Point and Wills. A briefer moment to think about Cindy. Then she stopped thinking altogether. Until a few minutes later, when she glanced again out of her window and saw the flashing lights out on Cemetery Point, saw them careening away toward town along the coast road. Dave, look. Oh, my God. It's happening again, isn't it? I wonder which one of us it is this time. Dorian was staring at the side of his car, at the deep gouges made by the branches in his panic-stricken escape. Someone was trying to scare him. Georgie probably wasn't even dead. This whole routine was probably Cindy's idea. He had to stop panicking. He took a deep breath. Time to ease on down the road. But to where? He couldn't go back to school. Being suspended for cheating had put that away for him. He turned and almost screamed. Someone was standing in the corner of the garage. She walked toward him. Then Dorian realized he was right. It had all been some awful joke. Georgie wasn't really dead. <sighs> You're sick, Georgie. Did it turn you on doing that to me? You got so excited you had to come and find me, is that it? Is that what you think? Dorian. <laughs> Dorian moved towards her, his hands clenched. Georgie waited, smiling. Charity sat in a booth at the burger bar, alone. She'd been there a couple of hours. It was comforting, the jelly bean colors, the relentless piped-in music. She should have gone over to Jane's, she didn't want to. She just wanted to sit there and not think about Jones or love or death. Funny how those three things seemed to go together. She slid her hand into her pack and touched the spine of the journal. 
and suddenly the burger bar felt confining. She looked at her watch. It was time to cruise. Cher walked slowly across the burger bar parking lot, her pack bumping against her back. Then she heard it, sensed it. Someone was behind her. <gasps> no! Dade pulled his car into the hospital parking lot and led the way toward the emergency room entrance. An ambulance was backed up to the door, its light still flashing. Georgie's father was standing beside it. A police officer was saying something to him, her face a mask of professional sympathy. Nurses and doctors bustled as a stretcher was lowered gingerly from the ambulance and hustled through the ER doors. Beyond, the scene was one of frantic motion and white light. The ambulance driver was closing the doors at the back of his vehicle. Dade approached him. Excuse me. Yeah? Can you tell us what happened? Nobody knows. It looks like she got a dose of Jack the Ripper like the other guy did. Georgina. It was Georgina. They don't know who it is yet. She's too badly torn up. Hey, you guys shouldn't be here. Georgina's father had gone inside. They could see him through the windows talking to the police. Just then, a doctor came towards them down the corridor. He took off his glasses and slowly shook his head. And Jane knew Georgina was dead too. In the burger bar parking lot, Charity was trying to bring her racing heart back under control. Oh, Rick, boy, you guys scared me to death. Could you have called out or something? Sorry, Chair. We were just hanging and saw you. We were kind of looking for Jane. Jane? I called and she wasn't home. She went out for a walk. This isn't exactly the safest time to be out in the dark alone. She's probably home by now anyway. But Foy looked as unconvinced as Chair felt. Fishing in her pocket, she nodded toward the phone booth at the corner of the parking lot. I'm going to give her a quick call, okay? Good idea. Oh, we'll wait. When Cher called Jane's house, Hodges answered the phone. Jane wasn't back yet. And Cher suddenly began to feel very, very afraid. Standing in the shadowy overhead lights of the garage, Dorian could feel the sweat on his palms and forehead. Funny you could be so sweaty and so cold at the same time. <laughs> Georgie? <laughs> Georgina? The figure in the shadows took a step towards him this time. He stepped back. You're not really dead. Oh, I'm not dead. I'm very, very hard to kill. She took another step towards him. Dorian took another step back, felt the cool metal of his car beneath his hands, smelled the rank smell of sweat, his sweat, and another smell, a cloying stench, a dead smell. No, you're not Georgie. And now Dorian smelled another, sharper smell, gasoline. Get away! Don't come any closer! <laughs> Who are you? Who do you want me to be, Dorian? <gasps> the figure in Georgie's shape smiled, reached down, came up with a pack of cigarettes and a match. Slowly, it took a cigarette out of the pack. You killed Wills, didn't you? And, and Georgie. Who shall I be? The first time. I was a sorry sight. I could barely get it together for Wills. But then, with sweet Georgina, I could be a little more creative. I... Jack the Ripper? How old, Dorian? <laughs> Jack the Ripper! Or Clarence? Or in the nautical line? Captain! But I like Jack. Yes. Jack would do for now. Smiling, 
figure that was not Georgie clenched the cigarette between its teeth. Slowly, it struck a match, made an elaborate show of lighting the cigarette. Careful light, Dorian. No! Get away! The lit match flew through the air. Get away! Yes! Tell them, Jack! Charity had just left the telephone booth when she heard the explosion. For a moment, she didn't believe it was real. Then she heard the fire station siren down the street go into action. Whoa, oh, man! That? Did you hear that? <laughs> hot, hot, hot! Boy, Jane's still not home! Come I'm... on, you guys, let's go see the fire! Rick, don't you care that something might have happened to Jane? Oh, right. Maybe it's her house that's on fire. It's in the right direction. It's in the right direction, but it's... It's not Jane's house. Oh, yeah. Let's go check it out. Come on. Okay. We'll go in my car. Okay. Dave Walken's big Chevy roared through the dark streets of Point Harbor. Beside him, Jane sat tensely. The hospital had disappeared into the night behind them. Now they were following the flickering light of the fire on the horizon. Whatever it was, it couldn't be any worse than what had just happened. As Dave turned down a tree-lined street, apprehension gripped them both. Cindy lived at the end of that street. And Dorian. Yes, Jane suddenly realized, this could be worse. Much, much worse. Get those people back there! Get them back there behind the line! A fire in Point Harbor was a big event, but a fire in the rich section of town was ranked public entertainment. The public was already there, pulling up in his cars, leaning out of windows, standing on roofs to see the show. Dade found a clear space at the side of the street and pulled in. Come on, Jane. Look, Dave. It's the garage that's on fire. Yeah. Just the garage. But just the garage was enough. Burning like the fires from some Bible thumper sermon lighting up the sky. The firefighters worked frantically, trying to keep it from spreading to the house. Jane! Chair, oh, what are you doing here? We were at the burger bar when we heard the explosion. I called your house, but you weren't home. You were worried. Where were you? I, I was with Dave. Chair, Georgina's dead. She's what? She's dead. We just came from the hospital. They found her out on the point tonight. At the point? Georgie? Like, like Will? Yeah, at least that's what they say. The five friends stared at one another. Beyond them, the front door of the house suddenly opened, and a fireman appeared with his arm around Cindy. Cindy! Cindy! Over here! The fireman escorted Cindy towards them. She was crying. No one had ever seen Cindy cry before. As they moved across the well-manicured lawn, another fireman stepped towards them. Is that everybody? Nobody else in the house? Hey, tell, see? We got all the servants out. This is the daughter. Parents are out for the evening, but the son still isn't accounted for. Dorian? Oh my God, Dorian! Thank you, Miss. I'll send the Dorian, what have I done? Oh, Cindy, I killed. <laughs> I killed my own brother, but I didn't mean it. I didn't mean it. <laughs> in the cozy den in Jane's house, the fire burned tamely in the grate. Cindy held a mug of hot milk in her hands. The paramedic had given her something to calm her. She'd stopped crying. Now she just stared down at nothing. They were waiting for her parents to be located and told the news. Cindy, no. it's not your fault. No, you don't know the whole story. Dorian and I hated each other. We used to do awful things. One day we were playing hide and seek. I was five. I hid in a cedar chest in the attic and Dorian found me. Only instead of letting me out, he locked the trunk. I don't know how long I was there, hours. It 
was dark when they found me. I thought I was going to die there. After that, I knew nothing would ever scare me again. And nothing was going to stop me from, from getting even with my brother, Cindy. Let me finish. I waited. I told Dorian I wanted to play hide-and-seek again. Pretended I really believed that the trunk had locked by accident. He hid in a closet. I think he thought he would jump out and really scare me, but I locked the door on him. And then I found some matches. I set fire to a wastebasket in the room. Dorian smelled the smoke. He was terrified. He begged me to let him out, just like I begged him. We have a very good security system in our house. The fire department's connected directly to it, so they got there in time. I told them where he was. I, I was crying. Whew, I got into a lot of trouble for playing with matches. I was always bad after that. A bad girl. And Dorian was always very, very good. It's okay, Cindy. No, it's not okay. Because Dorian was in the garage tonight. In the garage? Uh-huh. No. How can you be sure? It's where he went when I left him. He was there with his car. Mm -hmm. I think he'd been with Georgie. I, I think now whatever was after Georgie was after him. I think something is out there, and it's going to get us all. Uh, Cindy, that's crazy. Yeah. What you're saying is crazy. Oh, well, she's right, more or less. Jones, how did you get in? The old-fashioned way, through the front door. Your guy let me in. You know what, Jones? Nothing ever happened until you got here. No one was dead before you came along. If I confess, will you feel better? You are despicable. Listen, something is out there. I'm not even sure what it is, but it is after us, collectively and individually. <laughs> Great. It's big, it's bad, it's mad, and it's out there looking for us. How do you know that, Jones? Are you some kind of supernatural bounty hunter? How do we know it isn't some kind of trick? Maybe he's just having us on. Foy, it's no trick. Three of us are dead. This is stupid. You are all stupid. Just go away. Take it easy, Cindy. Someone killed Wills on Halloween night. Three days later, in the same place, Georgie is dead. And Dorian's burned What happened alive. to Dorian could have been an accident. It's not the same as what happened to Wills and Georgie. It wasn't an accident. I know it wasn't. How do you know that, Cindy? When Dorian came back tonight, I was waiting. When he pulled into the garage, he was scared. When he ran off to the house, I looked at his car. There were deep gouges all down the sides. Wherever he had been, he drove away so fast, he didn't care what he drove through. Didn't care about the damage to his beloved BMW. He must have known something was after him. Oh, my God. That book, the one you gave me, Jones, it talks about something that happened in Point Harbor when it was a sailing port, something that caused ships to sink, that haunted Cemetery Point. What? What? And not just out there, but the whole town. What? Oh. What, is what book? What are you talking about, Chair? Okay. Quiet, Rick. Let her finish. Jones? Yeah, that's right. Huh? And it got stopped, somehow. Yes. But I don't know how. Something inhuman that got buried out there in the graveyard a long time ago? Yeah, something dead and buried. Until something woke it up. We woke it up, didn't we, Jones? On Halloween night, we went to a party in a graveyard, and we woke the dead. The fire had started to die out. Cindy's parents had come and gone. Cindy was staying with Jane that night. The cops had been there, too. Dorian had been in the garage. They'd found his body. The police were looking at a possible link between Georgie's death and Dorian's. Murder-suicide, they said. No one bothered to disagree. Now the little group sat still by the dying fire, listening as Chair finished reading aloud from the little book. Was not buried or right. There is no peace for wronged blood. She was beautiful once. That's it. That's all there is. So, whatever it is, has been around for a long time. They must have buried it out there on Cemetery Point. Maybe did something to make it stay put. Like how they bury vampires with a stake through the heart. And then they closed up the joint. Until we came along. We should tell the cops. Oh, yeah. <laughs> right, Rick. What are we going to tell them? Oh, officer, there's a serial killer out there with superhuman powers. Supernatural powers. Look, we can't trust anyone. Not the cops, not our parents, not our friends. Look around, Jones. We're all friends here. We can't trust anyone. Think about what we just heard. 
Whatever it is, it has supernatural powers. It can change shapes, remember? Power to mimic form and life and shadow. Oh, come on, Cher. No way, get real. Yeah, 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 we have to do a little reality check here. I mean, something or, or someone is stalking us. Maybe it's some flipped wig weirdo we unwrapped when we did the graveyard party. Maybe. But an old book and a bunch of words are not what's real in all this. <laughs> Hope it turns into a babe. A beautiful built blonde babe before it goes after me. Godric, you are disgusting. Why don't you believe me? I don't know what to believe. So what are we supposed to do while this alleged supernatural serial chopper is in town? Oh, I travel in threes for the rest of our lives? I don't even think traveling in threes would do it. Oh. We're all going to die? Shut up, is that what you're saying, John? Yeah. Oh, no, I am not going to die. I am going to fight. I will stop it. No, wait. No. Shut up. Shut up. Shut up. Shut up. Shut up. Cindy ran wildly down the stairs, out the front door and along the long driveway. It was almost uncanny how fast she could run. The rest of them ran after her into the night. We'll catch her. There! This must be your taillights up ahead. Yeah, that's her. Boy, look at her go. There aren't any cops around when you need it. Maybe they're still at the point. So it's been hours since they found Georgie. Maybe they sealed off and all gone home. She's not getting away from us, at least. Oops. She's turning. Hold on. Oh. Oh. Nice seat, uh. The back bay road. <laughs> She's going down the back bay road. To the point. Let's hope the cops are still there. They won't be. Oh, God. We're not going back out there. We don't have a choice. We've got to stop her. I have a choice. I'm not going out there. You want to get out, Rick? Be my guest. Yeah. yeah we're Jack. not stopping. You crazy Dave. You know that? It's like I'm going to hit the blacktop to a 90. Because then I'm afraid you're in for a long haul, pal. Yeah. She just turned down the road to Cemetery Point. Hold on. But the gate will be locked. She's got to stop for the gate, man. Yeah. Don't count on it. They'd slowed down a little now. The road was just as bumpy as it had been on Halloween night. The trees leaned in just as closely. Only the moon wasn't full. Cher was afraid. But this time, it wasn't a pleasurable fear. This time, it wasn't your basic Halloween apparition that was lurking in wait for them. This was real. This was death. Look out! We're coming up to the gate! Wow, look at that! She drove right through it! Nothing stops that girl. From the look at that gate, your cars are gone, or Josie. Well, maybe it should be, but it isn't. Look, there's her taillights ahead. What's that car made of, Jones? Kryptonite. Go with the wish. Here's the clearing. There's your car, Jones. Boy, look at that front end. The front of Jones's car was twisted all out of recognition, the headlights broken, one light on, the other shattered and dead. The driver's door was open. Cindy was nowhere in sight. Now what are we going to do? Well, let's go find her. No, wait. Have any of you thought of this? Maybe that's not Cindy up there. What? Leading us all out here. Maybe is not Cindy at all. Not Cindy? Well, what do you mean? We were with her all night. We weren't with her when her brother died. Whatever. We need to stay together. That's critical. We could hold hands. Form a chain. Holding hands is a good idea. Give me yours, Chair. Okay. I got my flashlight. Let's do it. I want you to know, Foy, that just because I'm holding your hand, it doesn't mean we're going steady. <laughs> Chair, what are you thinking about? Sunrise. I was thinking about how in the vampire movies, when the sun comes up, that's when the vampire dies. What are you thinking, Jones? I'm thinking you can't see anything in the dark if you look at it head on. It works better if you look a little to one side. What is it we're supposed to see? Cindy, hopefully. Or whatever it is that's after us. What if what you see scares you to death? Chair. If you let something scare you to death, then the worst has happened. That's comforting, Jones. Should my life be in danger, remind me of that. I will. There is the graveyard. We're here. Now, where is Cindy? Uh oh There's something up there ahead. What? Is that her? Let's go see. Cindy? <laughs> 
<laughs> I love parties. <laughs> it's time for a party. Hey, don't you love parties? <laughs> it's time for this one to be over. I love parties. Hey, Cindy. This has been done. It's old. Let's go somewhere else. Okay, let's. <laughs> Coming close to Dade, Cindy leaned forward, snatched the flashlight from his hand, and threw it high in the air. As it fell, she turned and darted into the darkness. Stand to it now! Jane! Let me go for you! Jane, hey, go! Stay together! We have to stay together! Oh, too late now. Oh, this is bad. This is crazy. We gotta get out of here. Settle down, Rick. Turn loose my hand. Calm like, down. Let me go! Let Come go. on, Rick. Let go! All right, you asked for this. Oh. I have my hand out cold. Boy, I don't believe you did that. Now he can't run away. Then he can't stay with us either unless we carry him. Why? We can't leave him here, not by himself. Listen, what did you want me to do? Let him run off into the night like everyone else? Give me a oh. Suddenly, Chair stopped right. listening. She was frowning. Something was bothering her. What was it? Foy and Jones were propping Rick up against the wall, trying to get him to wake up. Suddenly, a vast lethargy washed over her. She wanted to sit down, to go to sleep. Oh, I'm getting the flashlight. Chair? I'll be right back. I'm just gonna go get that flashlight. Chair, wait! No, 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 don't worry. I'll be right over here. Like a sleepwalker, Charity strolled into the darkness, moving towards the distant glow of the flashlight. There. There it was. She bent to pick it up and saw the writing on the tombstone. Charity Webster, born 1888, died. No. Chair? Charity picked up the flashlight and turned it onto the grave marker. It was no mistake. The name on the stone was hers. Chair. Look. The name. Chair began to shake. The light shimmied in her hand. Then she turned the light on Jones's face. Jones held up his hand, wincing. Hey, Chair, you're blinding me. What is going on here, Jones? Tell me now. If I knew that. You knew about that book. You're the one who gave it to me. Where did you get it? I can't explain now. Oh, when I'm dead, it's too late, Jones. Way too late. Chair, you're hysterical. Why do guys always say that? Charity was trembling. She was afraid. No. No. She felt powerful. Strong. Suddenly, she felt the same immortal power rising up through her body that she had felt in her dream. A terrible shudder rocked the earth. Chair stumbled, and the flashlight fell from her hand and went out. A thousand impressions poured over her, each distinct and clear. Her human senses were gone. This was something more, much, much more. In the darkness, she saw Jones's mouth move, but she couldn't hear him. She smelled at first. A familiar smell somehow. Rank and ashy. She heard it next. The tread of something heavy. Something hunting. Then she felt it. It was standing behind her. She closed her eyes and the terrible power coursing through her brought with it a vision. A woman was standing at the edge of the sea. The water boiled around her. The smoke of torches lingered in the air. But the others were gone. They'd run away. They'd left her there. Not me. The woman is not me. She opened her eyes. A grave's length away, a figure stood, pale and shimmering by the graveyard wall. The woman. The woman from her vision. The woman from her dreams. Who are you? What do you want? The woman raised her arms. Charity took a step forward. It was as if she'd been punched in the chest. Gasping, she stopped. Roaring filled her ears. But beneath the roar, a fierce and ancient voice whispered, Turn! Turn! With the voice came that sense of scalding, dangerous power. Charity obeyed the voice. The woman owned her now. Chair had been chosen. 
trembling with mortal fear and immortal rage, Cher slowly turned to face the thing that waited in the shadows behind her. Then the shadows began to move, writhing. Run! Something inside her screamed. Run! No! Stay! Charity did not move. She watched, without breathing, without thinking, as a figure walked out of the contorted dark. <laughs> Laura? That's right. It's me. <laughs> no, you're not Laura. Laura's home. She's safe. No one's safe from me. I took Wills, and then I took Laura. Don't you believe me? Hello, light here. Don't listen. Silence! Silence! <gasps> Jones? No! Leave him! The thing in Laura's shape moved closer. The bloody princess dress moving of its own accord, tugged by invisible eddies. Chair stepped back. I've been waiting for you. You're not Lara. I'm not? <laughs> oh dear, how did you guess? Lara smiled again. Horrified, Chair watched as the smile began to split her face. Chair took another step back, and another, and felt something brush her shoulder. It was the woman behind her. It's me. The woman's hand closed on Cher's shoulder. Where it touched her was cold, but through the hand, Cher felt the power surging into her, making her back arch as if she were caught in an electric current. Say it! It's me! It's me! It's me! It's me! It's me! It's me! The thing wearing Lara's face smiled and took two more steps forward. The rotting, scorching smell filled Cher's lungs. She couldn't breathe. She was going to die. No, I won't give up. I won't give up. Seize him! No! Charity lunged forward and clutched the ripper in her arms. And now another face began to pulse into shape beneath the torn Lara smile. Will's face. Will's dead. Will's dying. Help me. Help me. I can't. You're dead. He was so strong. But she held on. She didn't look away. The figure threw back its demon head and howled. <laughs> Then the face split again, and beneath the shining blood, the face of Georgina now looked back at Cher. You hated me! You killed me! No, I was wrong, but I didn't kill you. The thing that was now Georgina twisted wildly in her arms, and the face split again. Now it was Dorian's burned dead face, Dorian's desperate eyes. You could save us now. Let me go. No! Let me go! Now Dorian's face tore open before her eyes, and she saw herself, her own face, her own smile, and heard her own voice coming from the lips of the other. Mirror, mirror on the wall. What you see is what you get. (laughs) Cher felt her own body in her arms, felt it turn to slime and gore beneath her hands, saw her own lips draw back and spit, blood and gobbets of flesh. Charity held on. Then the pain began. The awful grief for the killing, for the eternity of loneliness. Her own pain, her own grief, and the woman's. Charity tightened her hold. Something sharp as death pierced her above the heart, and her heart contracted with pain, and then with awful joy. The joy of victory and release. Then the earth tore open beneath her feet and she was falling, falling into her own grave where it had waited for so long. No, not my grave. It's her grave, the woman's grave. Let me go. I am not you. Cher felt the power within her begin to subside. The phantom woman, her other self, had been received into the earth. Cher was alone inside herself now. She was free. Behind her, as Cher fell into the grave, the sun began to rise, and the thing in her arms began to howl. Rest in peace. 
Charity held on. She was in the grave. Earth closed around her. She was being buried alive. The thing was pulling her deeper and deeper as the earth shuddered and sealed itself together over her face. <laughs> Jones pulled his car into the overlook. Charity got out and walked to the rail and looked out at the point. It was not so big now as it used to be. The morning after she'd met the Ripper, a chunk of the point had torn away and fallen into the ocean. The graveyard was gone. But that had been a while ago. Autumn was turning into winter now. The nightmares were going away. The killings had ended. Hey. Hey. You did good out there. I didn't have a choice, did I? I'm sorry, Chair. I wish I could have been more help. It's okay. You made up for it when you grabbed my ankle and hauled me up out of that grave. You saved us all. It was the least I could do. (laughs) Just admit it, Jones. You couldn't keep your hands off me. (laughs) (laughs) It was her. The woman. She needed me to help her be buried inside the graveyard. That was her grave on the outside. She'd stopped the Ripper before somehow. They thought she'd made an unholy pact with him. That's why they kept her out. And whoever kept that journal had a grave made for her inside, just in case. She had my name, Jones. It was on that tombstone. An ancestor of yours, maybe. Whoever she was, she took the Ripper with her. We raised that thing, didn't we? That night at Cindy's party? If we hadn't done that, Wills, Georgie, Dorian... They might all still be alive. If we hadn't done it, something else would have. Mm. And because we did, that first charity had a chance to rest in peace at last. I hope she is at peace. But is the Ripper dead? The graveyard is gone. I don't know. Maybe it just changed shape again. I thought it gotten Lara, too. That's what the Ripper told me. You tried to warn me that it was a trick. Just another gruesome trick to confuse you. But it would have gotten Laura, too. It would have gotten all of us. Each killing made it stronger. How did you know what would happen? I didn't. But the book. What about the book? I found it in my travels. (laughs) Cher, I always believe everything I read. You, you're impossible. (laughs) (laughs) Hey, Jules, Cher. Come on. And we're going over to Laura's. Who's we? You know. Boy, Rick, Cindy. The usual party animals. Ah, uh, thanks, Dade. Maybe later. Okay. I'm loose. Sorry, I should have asked. Did you want to go? Later. But for now, I like this party here just fine. <laughs> In The Cemetery by D.E. Atkins, Cindy was played by Laurel Lefko, Lara by Liza Ross, Georgina by Danica Fairman, Foy by Walter Lewis, Jane by Bridget Dooling, Rick by Alan D. Marriott, Dade by David Jarvis, Wills by James Christian, Charity by Barbara Barnes, Jones by Corey Johnson, Dorian by Michael Fitzpatrick. Hodges and the Policeman were played by William Roberts. The narrator and the voice of the Ripper was Bill DeFries. Other parts in The Cemetery were played by the Story Circle Company. The Cemetery was adapted by William Roberts, and the music and studio production was by John Mayfield. It was directed by Bill DeFries. The Cemetery was a Story Circle production for Scholastic Publications Limited.